are you aware of how you've taken your recovery and you're doing this physical part you're doing this cognitive part where you talk about your, your goals your process and then you do this other part which is in pictures and in images and to the point where you've got the emily strikes back on your t-shirt are you aware of like how imagery is important in supporting recovery as well as the words yes. and the actions absolutely the reason why he started the instagram page was so i could look mm. back at my progress so that when at the end of the day when he came from after work and was reading me to sleep at night and he had said what did you do today how was your day and I would say, well, I, I did this thing, but I couldn't do this and I couldn't do this. And I, the key word is always yet. I couldn't do this thing yet. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 112. And my guest today is Emily Hoffman. Emily experienced a stroke caused by a carotid artery dissection in May of 2019, and has been on the road to recovery ever since. Has your recovery had to take a backseat due to COVID-19 restrictions? If you're feeling a little disconnected from your support team due to restrictions from COVID-19 shutdowns and lockdowns, and you're looking for more support, you may want to consider recovery after stroke coaching. People that have already signed up for recovery after stroke coaching get 12 months of unlimited access, a private one-on-one -on -one coaching thread with myself via a private forum inside the coaching area. You have instant access to online training materials that can only be accessed by coaching clients. You get access to courses, monthly trainings, and challenges made by a stroke survivor for other stroke survivors. You also get expert interviews that are only available to coaching clients and MP3s you can download for listening on the go. All trainings are transcribed to PDF for people that prefer to read and take notes or highlight important bits for reviewing at a later time. You also get two live hour long coaching calls per month where you can ask questions and get answers. You can access the site 24 hours a day, seven days a week and complete training at your own pace without ever having to leave the comfort of your own home. To find out more, simply go to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash coaching. And now it's on with the show. Emily Hoffman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. I am honored to be here. Thank you for being here. It's so good to have you here. Um, all the way from New York, New York. Brooklyn, New York. Oh, Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Brooklyn, New York. Not bad. And do you live near a place called Clifton Hills or Clifton Hill? We live in a neighborhood called Clinton Hill. <laughs> close. You're very close. When I read that, I thought it was Clifton Hill because there's a Clifton Hill near my place. And I thought, wow, we both live near Clifton Hill. Oh, we actually live in Australia in Clifton Hill. Fooled you. Ha ha. <laughs> hey, Emily, tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Um, I was at work one day on Friday, May, May 10th, 19, or 2019. I don't know what the date is. Friday, May 10th, 2019. I had started a new job and I was literally on the third day of my onboarding. I started the new job on Tuesday, the, th the 7th. On Friday, the 10th, I was at work doing an onboarding course. Started to get a horrible migraine. And I have had migraines since I was a kid, since I was about six years old. It was another migraine like any other. I, I texted Matt. I said, I'm going home from work early. I have a horrible headache. And he said, do you want me to come home early from work and look after you? I was like, what are you talking about? It's a migraine. You see me have a million of them. What do you, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to take my medicine. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go to sleep, turn the air conditioning on. And I'm going to sleep the rest of the day. What are you going to do? Sit next to me in the bed and like brush my hair off my face? That'd be romantic though. Yeah. So I said, don't be silly. He had plans to go out with his cousin that night. I said, go out, have fun, go to the show, have a good time. I left work at about two o'clock. I took the train home. I got home at about four o'clock. I walked home. Um, so no stroke yet. I, other than the headache, I was totally fine. Everything worked normally. Um, this, is the, this is a gross part. We've already talked gross things, but it gets grosser. I, when I get migraines, I throw up. So I have, enough, I have a designated puke bowl. 
And I took my puke bowl into the bedroom and went to sleep. That was the end of it. Went to sleep and filled the, managed to fill the puke bowl in the interim. Woke up sometime around six o'clock, I think. I don't remember looking at the clock, but my memory of what it looked like light-wise outside, it was about six o'clock p.m. So I've been home for a couple of hours looked at the bowl and said, oh, that's disgusting. I can't possibly have Matt come home and find me in bed with a bowl full of puke next to me. That's awful. So I got up, I carried the bowl to the bathroom, still no stroke, carried the, pool, the, the bowl to the bathroom, dumped it, flushed it, went back to bed. And next thing I know, he got home from the show with his cousin, like 1, 1 a.m., I think, something like that, tried to wake me up. And I had been... I, I guess I had been continuing to throw up while I was asleep and was when I get migraines, I also go in like a cold sweat. I was drenched and had been throwing up and he woke me up. Like clearly that's not normal. That's not a normal thing. You don't find somebody asleep in bed with vomit in a cold sweat. It's disgusting. I'm sorry. Sorry, listeners. That's disgusting. Yeah. Um, he woke me up and his cousin luckily had, he worked in hospitals. So he saw me and he said, something's not right. You got to call 911. They called 911. The, they, he sat me up to get dressed. I sat up and I reached forward with my arm to grab my leg to help him help me get dressed. Couldn't reach my leg. My whole left side was totally loose. And um, that was when he knew something is very wrong here. The, the ambulance came, the EMTs put me on the stretcher, wheeled me out out with me out to the lobby of our building and there's like four stairs to go down i remembered being being wheeled through our our living room we have two cats and i had just cleaned out their litter boxes and i didn't throw the bag full of litter away and i remember being wheeled through the living room and thinking oh this is disgusting there's a bag full of dirty cat litter on the floor i can't believe there are people in my home and i left that here that's disgusting like this is what i remember and I remember going the clunk, clunk, clunk down the stairs in the lobby and being in the ambulance. There's a highway in New York called the FDR, the, the, the Federal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Highway that takes you up the east side of Manhattan Island. And it's very bumpy. It's notoriously bumpy. And it was so bumpy that I remember waking up and asking Matt, are they doing a CT in the ambulance? Are they... I thought that I thought it was in like a like an ambulance with a CT because it was so bumpy. And um, next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital bed a couple of days later um, with a horrible, horrible headache again. They had shaved my head, and because there was so much swelling in my brain, I got a hemicraniotomy that took out the right side of my skull. And I had, obviously, when they mess with your skull, you're going to get a little bit of a headache. So I had a horrible, horrible headache all over again. And I remember I woke up, and it was, it was not one of those moments like in a movie where you wake up and you go, where am I? What am I doing here? How do I get here? It was nothing like, I wish it was dramatic and interesting like that. I woke up, and that was it. And I was in the hospital bed, and there was people around me. And I had a horrible bandage around my head and my hair. I had just finished growing my hair out from having short hair the year before. My hair was finally long again. And I was so excited that it was finally long again. Then they shaved it all off. And now I'm stuck with this thing now. <laughs> and That's probably not the worst thing you're stuck with. No, it's not the worst thing I'm stuck with. If I had to choose, I would. the hair is good. <laughs> and um, I was in... Uh, sorry, acute rehab for the first um, first two months. And then I was from acute rehab, I went to subacute. And the subacute rehab was the next step before going home. So I had two months in acute and then another two months in subacute. So this all happened in May. I came home September 18th, 2019. Wow. Wow. So I'm approaching the year of being home, the year mark of being home. Wow. What was the underlying cause of the stroke? Uh, it was a carotid dissection, a right-sided carotid dissection. Right. Which it was interesting. I listened to the other episode of the other woman who had a carotid dissection also months ago. And it was really interesting to hear that somebody else, because I, I have, I, you know, I've speak with lots of stroke survivors. The Instagram page has put us in touch with other people. Yeah. 
she was the first person I heard of who also had a carotid dissection. Yeah, I think that was, who was that? I forget, Marcy maybe? Marcia Moran. Yes, Marcia Moran, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, so there, it's quite common. I, I've met people who have had carotid artery dissections nice down low in their neck. Mm. And as a result of that, that's caused uh, stroke. And that person um, who's one of my son's friends had um, surgery to repair both carotid arteries. Oh, um, luckily I did not have that. That's awful. That's uh, probably even worse. Yeah, on each side. But he didn't actually end up having the kind of stroke that you had because it somehow didn't get to his brain that dramatically it didn't cause a problem up there that dramatically so he was up and about and doing really well quite quickly so um nice. it's not uncommon but what's fascinating to me is the amount of different ways people can get to having an experience with a stroke and that just completely blows me away because if i've ever heard of somebody having a stroke it's always been an ischemic stroke and very rare did i hear about people experiencing brain hemorrhages and then very rare did I hear about uh, people having a stroke due to a hole in the heart, which oh, is interesting. called the patent foramen ovale, which creates an incorrect blood flow. And then that causes a stroke. It's just so many, many different ways that people get there. Um, so you wake up in hospital and it's not a dramatic yeah. awakening, but Matt's around are you wondering yes. at least like what happened? Like, how did I get here? I honestly don't remember that moment whatsoever. I, I remember that my sister lives in Spain. My sister's in Spain. My mother goes once a year for about a month or two to spend the summer with my sister in Spain. And my mother was, this was the month that my mother was in Spain with my sister. I vaguely remember, my sister was there when I woke up. I vaguely remember being on the phone with my mother while she was in Spain and her saying, well, I'm coming home. And I said, don't come home. It's just a stroke. I'm not dead. It's fine. It's just a stroke. I'm not dead. And I, and she told me, she told me that I did that. But even before she told me, I rem I have really this very vague memory of doing that saying, I'm not dead. It's just a stroke. It's fine. Stay. You don't have to come home. I had the conversation with Matt go. Um, I don't remember. It was just kind of, it just sort of like, there was never a conversation about it. What are you going to have a conversation about? Well, what do we do now? There was, it, it just, he just kind of swooped, he, he swooped in and just kind of took control of the situation, kind of saw what needed to be done and started doing it. Yeah, that's common. I mean, I mean and I can relate to that because we, Christine and I, we didn't speak about anything either. It was kind of like, oh, okay, you've, this is happening. All right, this is what I need to do today. Right. I need to go pick up the kids. I need to go do the shopping. Mm -hmm. I need to go see my mum and dad. And I'll come back and see you in a little while. Um, and then she'd come back and see me. And then she had to go to work. And life just went on. And there was this little bit of added complexity that we didn't know how it was going to mm -hmm. unfold. And um, she basically did did exactly what Matt did. She just kept going and kept doing whatever needed to yeah. be done. He somehow managed to continue working full time and be with me every day at the hospital. And the entire time I was in the hospital, he was there every single day. When I was in subacute, when I was in the acute rehab, he would come after work every day, stay there until 11 or 12 o'clock. He would read to me as I went to bed, he would read to me. We read my stroke of insight. Jill Bolte Jill Taylor. Bolte Taylor. Yes. Yeah, so good. So good. Amazing book. So That's one of my that, favorite yeah. books. I've tried to Our get, friend of mine. Yeah. I've tried to you get, get her on the show. Interview. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've tried so many I've, times. It's so hard. I'm sure a friend of mine, actually a former coworker of mine just had a stroke last week. I got her a copy of it. Yeah. It's one of the, it's one of the best books because it gives that insight from a neuroscientist's perspective yeah. as well as a stroke survivor's perspective. And they mm -hmm. come together and she just sends, she, she, she's our voice is how I sort of describe it in that she gives the medical people I... unbe unbelievable understanding in, in a medical kind of way 
what stroke survivors go through and we don't have that often. I was almost, I was a little jealous of her experience. I, I was like, I want to know I, the way she described the, the filing cabinet getting washed away and it just being out of reach. I was like, I want to know what that was like. Why didn't I get to, I just, I just went to sleep and woke up. I got cheated. Yeah. She had like a uh, LSD moment there. It sounds like yeah, it's describing more of a, a, a kind of out of body experience with her having an awareness of what was going wrong with her brain mm -hmm. at the same time that it was going wrong. And also not knowing a lot of the things that were going wrong, but having this yep. awareness, which is just mm -hmm. so strange, bizarre and beautiful and amazing and horrible yes. and terrific all at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. That's the experience. Horrible and terrific. That's a perfect way to sum it up. It's horrible and terrific. Yeah. It's horrible that this is all ha that this is happening to any of us, but it's terrific that we survived it. Though you know, we mo many people don't survive this. Yeah. But we survived it for whatever reason, and we keep going, and we make the best of it. Yeah. What was it like when you started to get beyond the first few weeks of recovery and realized there's certain things you can't do? How did that affect your your psychology? That's exactly what my friend asked me the other day when I went to see her on Friday. That's the exact question. She, she's struggling right now. She said, how are you doing psychologically? It's not an easy thing. It's As somebody, I'm a personal trainer. My life is my body. And being fit and sporty, not that people's lives aren't their bodies outside of personal trainers, but you know, my career is my body. I have to be fit. I have to be strong. And I'm used to being fit and strong. And all of a sudden, I'm not able to do the stuff that I was used to doing. And that's been a strange experience, it, like trying to figure out if I can't do that stuff, then what am I? Who am I? And how do I, how do I get strong in a different way? If I, can't, if I can't do those workouts, what can I do to be strong? Like, what is the driving force? That's kind of what I had to realize. What is the driving force behind who I am, let's say, as a trainer or as an athlete? And the whole point was always to be the best version of what I always tell my clients is I'm going to teach you to be the best version of yourself that you're able to be. So I got to teach myself to be the best version of myself that I can be. That doesn't mean deadlifting 180 pounds. That doesn't mean squatting my body weight. It means taking what I've got going on now and making the best of it. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Kelly Studebaker is somebody I interviewed for episode 107 and she started weight training after the stroke and to nice. the extent that she wanted to be a power lifter, not just a regular kind of, uh, I'm going to push a couple of weights up. She wanted to do power yeah. lifting. And she I got used to, to power the point, lift. I loved it. Yeah, and she got to the point where she was able to, with one side of her body, um, do all these amazing things and lift, you know, real, really heavy weight. And you can see oh, one side of her body is really jacked and muscular and it's huge. It's a power lifter's body. So she, she moved into that space afterwards, just because I think she was challenged by somebody uh, in a gym. Somebody in the gym said to her, look, I think you can do power lifting if you want to, you just have to adapt like you're saying yeah, and be a different version of yourself and use what you have got instead of thinking about what you can't do and what you mm -hmm. haven't got. And it took her five years to get to that point where she was able to, I think, compete or be in a position oh, where she wow. was able to, yeah, to do some type of competition. And that's really what it's about, isn't it? It's about putting as much time and effort in into something that you're passionate about to get a result, a different result, but still to get a result. It never even occurred to me to do it one-sided. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's embarrassing that it never occurred to me, but it should have, but it never did. So you've got this opportunity to really learn from stroke. And I know this is almost painfully annoying to hear, but what has, you know, for some people it is, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from your experience? And I'm not um, talking about Emily needs to behave herself more, not those kind of lessons, right. but, you know, right. life lessons. Um, I never had one of those, I never had like a post stroke epiphany of, 
I could be this person now, or I, this is my life lesson I've learned. I, I haven't had one of those moments, really. I've learned that I have to be, I have to, what I have learned is I need to be patient with myself and that I need to, one, I need to set realistic goals. And the other is that when a goal is set for me, I do whatever it takes to get to that goal. My physiatrist said that she wanted me out of my wheelchair by the end of February. So February 28th, I sat in the chair and never sat in it again. Yeah. My next goal is to be rid of my cane by my birthday on the 14th of October. I see no reason why I won't be there. Yeah. Mostly I say my life lesson is that I am very goal oriented. And is it the goals something that you set at quite a distance into the future? Does the timeline that somebody sets for you help you? What kind of goals work for you? Because for me, if somebody gave me a timeline, it would probably not work for me in that if I didn't make it by the timeline, it would uh, upset me or frustrate me or whatever. Mm -hmm. What kind of goals work best for you? Um, well, I think I trust people. I, I trust the experts. I'm only an expert in a very small, small area of the fitness world. But when it comes to physical recovery, it's a totally different thing. You know, being a physical therapist and being a personal trainer, two very different things. Um, sort of in the same genre, but different. So I, so if the experts say we're going to get you to this place by this time frame, so all right, yeah, totally. Of course, if you think I can, of course I can. Yeah. If and, if the expert said that you can't do something how would you respond to that and say you clearly don't know me <laughs> say you, you you haven't met me have you not? i have my old boss actually it's funny so i went back to work sort of went back to work i'm teaching an online pilates class once a week still going back to work it's not in the studio but it's still going back to work and um we were i was talking to her when i was just about to go back to work and was telling her about some workouts I had been doing, a workouts I wanted to get back to doing. And she said, be careful, don't overdo it. And I said, have you ever met me? And she said, exactly why I'm, that's exactly why I'm telling you to take it easy and be careful. Okay. So if you, if you know me, you know I don't do anything half-assed. <laughs> Sorry to all the children listening. Yeah, there's no children listening. Um, okay. It's all good. So what you're saying is that once you've made a decision on a goal, you're pretty much going to, going after it no matter what. Yep, pretty locked in on it. And that's if I once it's set, once I'm going to I've decided I'm going to do it, it happens. Yeah. That's a pretty cool thing and time timeline doesn't seem to bother you. It doesn't seem to be an issue about time. So it's great to have is it great to have a time line but then not necessarily bother you if you don't get to that time. Right. I don't, I'm not going to be horribly devastated if I don't get to my birthday and I'm still using my cane or if yeah. I do get to my birthday and I'm still using my cane, I'm not going to be crushed or devastated. I'm just going to say, all right, well, I'll figure it out. I'll do it again later. I'll get rid of it another time. Yeah. Recently if you my made a post where you walked nearly a mile. Yes. How long has without it taken for you to get to that point where you can walk almost a mile without a cane? When did my no cane journey start? Yeah. Um, I think probably in the spring still. We're deep into August. And we're deep into summer in New York. So I think probably in maybe in March or April, I did my first couple of steps without the cane. I called it Frankensteps. I looked ridiculous. <laughs> so I did a little Frankenstep, Frankenstep tours around the neighborhood, every, like, you know, a couple of one block, and then I'd rest. I was exhausted. One block and I would rest. So I've gotten really serious about it. They're really in the past week or so, going out every day, doing what we call sprints, 
It's not a sprint, but it's a sprint. It's a no cane sprint. It's going, there's, we have a courtyard next to our building with a fence. So I, I sprint the length of the fence. I see how long it takes me to get from one point, one corner to the next corner. The first time I did it, it took a one minute and four seconds. Today I did it, it took me one minute and six seconds. I'm going in the wrong direction, but it was just the practice run. I'll figure it out tomorrow. Yeah. I just have to practice it. I, once I'm able to, I can do it once, I can do it again. Yeah. I told my friend the other day, I said, there's no regressing in stroke recovery. You do it once, you can repeat it. It's only moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what about the things that do get in your way from feeling motivated on a particular day? Do you ever have those days where you're feeling unmotivated and you say, stuff it, I'm not doing anything today? Absolutely. Well, I never have a day where I don't do something. I either, I try to do something new every day, one new thing a day. There are days, of course, when I just want to be lazy. I want to sit around. I want to fuck around on my phone. I want to watch something online. But I don't have that luxury. I don't have the luxury of just doing nothing. Yeah. I have to, I have to do something every day. What's the thinking behind that? You don't have the luxury. So is it because you're concerned about going backwards? Is it because there's so much to do? There's so much still to achieve. Like what, why don't you have the luxury to do nothing? There's so much left to achieve. There's so much more that I want to be able to do. Yeah. And it's early days. I mean, it really is still early days in yeah. your recovery. You're not. Yeah. It's only, it's only been a year and a half. Yeah. It's nothing. Yeah. The brain takes ages to heal properly. Mm -hmm. Even after the damage has been incurred, it's still interrupted and interfered with around the damaged site by other bits of inflammation and things that are sorting out and getting better. And then uh, that takes a couple of years on its own to settle down and heal. Oh, good. Then I, okay, good. That's actually good to know. I didn't know that. My doctors have not mentioned that. Yeah. So what happened to me was I found myself being technically free from the um, issue in my brain. The blood vessel that burst was no longer there. It was gone. Mm -hmm. But then I started to heal in this other way, which was an internal kind of brain healing that was different from the trauma of the surgery and different from the trauma of the bleed in the brain it was different from all of those traumas and there's kind of like it's like an onion you know there's multiple layers of different versions of healing and they all happen at different paces and at different rates so people that are listening who are bit, who are early on well they might have a kind of like aha moment a little bit down the track going oh my gosh i can do something that i didn't realize I hadn't done for a long time or I remembered something or I, or, or my focus has changed. And I had that just recently, probably in the last six weeks, if I'm honest, my brain has switched on to a point where I can focus and concentrate for a lot longer in front of a computer, especially now that we're in isolation, I'm unstuck at home and I'm doing a lot of online building my online courses and my offerings to the stroke survivor community. Um, I haven't been able to sit down and focus for eight hours a day and being in a computer was the worst thing that you could have done to me. Whereas now I've had this next kind of level of my brain switching on again. And it was, and it's really profound because I haven't experienced it for eight years. And I mentioned it to my wife uh, literally a couple of days ago and told her I've been so productive in this downtime I've never been so productive in, in the last eight years. That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that the perception for some stroke survivors when they're in the thick of it is that, oh my God, this is hard. It's always going to be hard. I'm never going to gain anything. I'm never going to achieve anything. But then there are these light bulb moments where things come on and you go, whoa, that's new or that's different or that's better. I think that's why part of it is I want to do something new every day. Yeah. Because I, if I don't want to feel like I get to a point. I mean, but there's so much more ground for me to cover in my recovery that mm. I think 
I, there's plenty of room for something new every day. Yeah. So you're yesterday, my something new was lifting, doing heel lifts in the kitchen. Tomorrow, my new thing will be to walk farther than I have before without my cane. But it seems like something so simple that you do the same walk you did without the cane before. Of course, I can do that again. I just add on another another block. I can do that. Yeah. That's easy. It's absolutely yeah. easy. And do you experience spasticity and left side um, proprioception issues and numbness and all that kind of thing? Uh, my proprioception has gotten much better lately. I don't have numbness. I have tons of spasticity. My, can't, my hand right now is a little fixed claw. My hand is, I've been doing a lot of mirror box. So I've been doing about a half an hour of mirror box every day for the past week or so. And my left hand has seized up dramatically. So mirror box is working in that my hand is getting another, like a bigger message to work, but it's overdoing it. So I have to stretch it a little bit more. My leg seems to be okay. Not a lot of spasticity in my leg. My, for a while, my toes were gripping. Not so much anymore. So they're getting better. Yeah, that's getting better. And I'm able, I have a tendency to roll my ankle on my left foot. Even before the stroke, I did that. Like a few months before the stroke, I had a small, I rolled my ankle at work and got a very small fracture. And I never really fully rehabbed my ankle. I was just about... I was just about 100% with my ankle, and then I had the stroke. And so the whole leg went to shit. Yeah, such a little so, thing, but it has such a major impact because yeah. it's so low, and your ankle being just a fraction out mm -hmm. impacts your entire you know, musculoskeletal system and puts yep. you out of whack at the top, which makes all well, your muscles tense up and tighten up and then not support you correctly. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's actually something that as in the classical Pilates world, we talk about all the time. You know, we, the, the hip bones connected to the foot bone and blah, 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 and so on and so on. Every bone is connected to something else in your body. Yeah. So if one thing is off, everything's off. So how do you rectify the ankle? Do you brace it? Do you do something with it? I have a really hardcore AFO that I wear, a custom made AFO for my left foot. And it holds me, it holds me in nice stable position. There was a period where I was stepping on the side of my foot and rolling my ankle during recovery. And that was, that was a proprioception thing is I just had no idea where my foot was. Yeah. In that sense, my proprioception has gotten much better that I, I know where my foot is landing when I'm walking now, but I take that as a win. Yeah. So I, I, my surgery was in November, 2014. So it's been nearly six years. Mm -hmm. And my proprioception is much better than what it was when I first started. But when I get tired, I will run into the doorway with my left side or my right side because I, I my proprioception kind of starts to fade. The quality of it starts to fade a little. And then my ability to judge distance compared to you know where the doorway is and where I my shoulder is also... Mm -hmm becomes irrelevant almost like it just kind of goes away it's not there and i well, often okay. find myself just bumping into the door into the doorway um and when i walk in the city with my wife or we go for a walk for exercise and she's next to me i'll forever find myself just walking into her path <laughs> towards her and she that's thinks, something i did before my stroke <laughs> and she, and she thinks that I'm, I'm trying to hog, you know, the footpath or the, or the walkway. And she's constantly telling me, just get out of my way. Stop walking into me. Uh, when I was a kid, that's actually funny you say that. When I was a kid, I would do the same thing. I'd be walking down the sidewalk with my mother. She would say, stop walking in my way. Get out of my way. You're walking. I would just kind of veer into her path. Yeah. As a, I had crappy proprioception even before I had a stroke, apparently. Yeah. So crummy. Yeah. So it's interesting that um, you're getting better. You're finding that things are improving slowly, mm -hmm. slowly. You're noticing that your ankle um, is supporting you better just because your proprioception deficits yeah. are changing and they're evolving. Absolutely. Um, and you've got a support, you've got a, you've got a, a brace that supports you. How does your knee 
work? Do you get a really good res- response from your, re- in your knee or does it sometimes lose the ability to hold you up? Because I used to stand up and then find myself, you know, doing the one knee dance, you know, these ducking and weaving yeah. routines. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. How's your knee doing? Uh, My knee is okay. The knee is the least of my worries. The knee is pretty good. It doesn't buckle underneath me anymore. When I was when I was at acute rehab in the very early days, um, it wouldn't do it. It just it just caved right underneath me. Yeah. And I would also get I would as I was on the treadmill getting you know as they say just get the reps in doesn't have to be pretty just do it. I was walking on the treadmill, my knee would start to hyperextend and snap backwards. It got really painful. It's fine now. It's gotten used to working again. It you sound like a, it has a job to do. Yeah. You sound like a really headstrong, really determined person. Um, yes. Really, if really. If you ask inter- anybody who knows me, that is how they would describe me probably. I've heard that many times before in my life. Really independent. Yes. So what was it like when you you realized that your some of your independence was gone? That's actually been the biggest struggle for me. Right. And I was just talking about that today with Matt. Matt has, I don't know how he does it. He's been with me every single day. He is the true hard worker in this situation. He's been with me every single day. He takes care of the house. We have an apartment in New York, so it's not much, it's not that big, but he does all of the household chores. Well, and it kills me that I can't help. It drives me crazy. Drives me crazy that I can't just go out for a walk on my own. I can't just go to the gym when I want to can't just go for a bike ride when I feel like it. So that's been the thing that most frustrates me is that I'm not able, I'm not able to participate anymore. I can't help out, help out around the house. I can't just go where I want to go when I want to. So I've had to learn to, I've had to learn to sound so corny, be nicer to myself. Sounds so hokey, but I've had to just kind of let it go. There's nothing, I mean, you know, I'm doing everything I can to get past that stage. I can't speed up recovery. Yeah. It's something that we spoke about with the OT sisters who are yeah. on the podcast episode that I am going to release just before this one. And cool. um, one of the tips that they give stroke survivors to support themselves is um, to be kind and to have compassion for yourself allow yourself to stuff up and not yeah. achieve something and not do something and then forgive yourself or be okay with it and mm-hmm. be, be your best advocate rather than be your um, biggest critic. Absolutely. Cause there's, there's only so much I can do to get better and I'm doing everything I can to get better. <clears throat> Are you at the stage where you can comfortably go into the shower and bathe yourself and do all of those types of things? Yep, that stuff I've been able to do for a while. I have a shower bench at home. And I'm lear- the hardest part of getting dressed is the bra. Whoops, I just lost my hand. Speaking of proprioception, proprioception, my hand just slid right off the armrest. Um, I've, the hardest part of getting dressed is putting my bra on. Yeah. Everything else I can do. The stupid bra clasp. So stupid. So I've had to figure out kind of problem solving techniques of how do I put a bra on myself? I had to buy a whole bunch of pullover bras. I'm figuring out the ways to make it happen. Yeah. 
I think there's a, a multi-million dollar invention in there for somebody because every time I speak to Absolutely. a woman, every time I speak to a woman who's had a stroke, the bra is a very, very big issue. Mm-hmm. And um, I reckon if somebody could solve that problem for them, um, yep. that would be amazing. And I think it needs to be a woman who's had a stroke, not a man who Absolutely. hasn't had a stroke. Yeah, there's there's one little toy that I, I found on YouTube. I'm not going to say the name because it's total crap. It's such a, it was such a waste. I was so excited about it. I was so hopeful and I got it and it just didn't work. And I was like, oh, okay, well, there goes that. That ship has sailed. I guess that's not happening for me. And then I just started buying the pullover kind. Yeah. If I want to be able to do something, I have to figure out a way that I can do it. Yeah. So the pullover kind is like a sports bra? Yeah, like a sports bra. Yep. That you would wear at the gym or going for a run or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Yep. And and I do it the same way I learned to put the T-shirt on. I pull the sleeve up and over my shoulder, spin it around, duck my head through, spread my other arm in. It's the only way I've been able to do it. And I'll take it. It works. It's worked so far. I'm, and it's the last piece of the getting dressed puzzle. I've, are you consciously aware? Of, uh, I know the answer is yes, but how did you become consciously aware of what Matt might be going through? And is there some things that Matt, your carer, is holding out on you and not really telling you about? Um, I don't think so. We're pretty honest with each other. I don't think he's holding it, holding in for any information out for me. He's, he's, if he's stressed, if he's tired, if he, he's exhausted. He tells me he's exhausted and it's understandable that he's exhausted. He's doing an impossible task all by himself. Yeah. And Does he? What, sorry, what were you going to say? Is he hard on himself as well? Yes, he is definitely hard on himself. And I think it's been a learning process for both of us that sometimes I have to say, you know what, I want to be able to do that myself, but I can't, like today in particular, he cooked dinner tonight. Obviously, he cooked dinner since I'm not, I'm not cooking dinner anytime soon. I sometimes do try to cook. I used to cook dinner every night, uh, but I was like, can't do that every night now. So he cooks every night. And after dinner, he joked. Oh, he said, you're going to go put the, wash the dishes? And I said, yeah, I'll go put the dishes in the dishwasher. He said, no, you're not. And I said, what do you mean? I could totally put the dishes in the dishwasher. He's like, you're not putting the dishes in the dishwasher. So he, I, I want to help. He knows I want to help, but there's a limit to how much help I can be. And he, he also, as much as he wants me to help, he's also realistic in knowing that there are some things I can't do still. Yeah. So I know when he's frustrated, I know when he's tired, it's definitely a stressor. Obviously it's a big stress on the relationship, Uh, but you figure it out. You yeah. figure it out. You have to have open and honest conversations. If something is bothering you and you don't talk about it, it's just going to turn into resentment. Yeah. And that's poison. Do you hold out on him? And from the perspective of, I, I know I do with my wife. So what I hold out on is some days when I'm feeling shitty again, which is all the time or whatever, I maybe don't share it with her again and all the time so that she doesn't have to hear about it all the time. At the beginning, she was getting it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then as it started to progress, I stopped sharing all of the juicy bullshit. He knows. He knows when I'm not feeling up the chuck. He says, are you all right? I go, yeah. He goes, are you sure? And then I start to think, wait, maybe I'm not okay. Does he see something I'm not aware of? (laughs) Why is is he asking me? Maybe I'm not okay and I just don't realize it. But he knows. He, He knows me better than anyone else. He can read me better than anybody else it's amazing it's kind of creepy but it's pretty amazing he knows when i'm feeling a little crummy and he knows how to get the information out of me when i'm feeling a little crummy yeah and he generally knows why i feel crummy too are you aware of how you've taken your recovery and you're doing this um physical part 
you're doing this cognitive part where you talk about your, your goals, your process. And then you do this other part, which is in pictures and in images. And to the point where you've got the Emily strikes back on your t-shirt, <laughs> which is, I loved it. When I had I saw to be that, on brand. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw that um, on Insta, I, automatically liked your page and said hello or something like that or commented nice. on one of your Thank posts. You. Are you are you aware of like how imagery is fully um, important in supporting recovery as well as the words yes. and the actions? Absolutely. The reason why we started the Instagram page was so I could look mm. back at my progress so that when at the end of the day, when he came from after work and was reading me to sleep at night and he had said, what did you do today? How was your day? And I would say, well, I, I did this thing, but I couldn't do this and I couldn't do this and I couldn't do this. The key word is always yet. I couldn't do this thing yet. And then he'll say, well, look back at this video. That's how the video started. Let's look at this video of this thing you couldn't do a week ago. You're doing it now. You couldn't do it today, but look at what you couldn't do a month ago. Now you can do this other thing. So it was always, the point of it was always to reflect back to see my progress. And that's really what it, that, I mean, that's how it started. And now it's become this other creature in and of itself that people from all over the world, I mean, you're in Australia, we've got people in, we've got Lena Ellsborg in um, Denmark and um, how Glow does it now in Texas. Yep. There are people from all over. Uh, Faye, the girl who survived, we've got Faye in um, the UK people from all over who have reached out. We have one woman in Peru, Clelia. She's, everybody's wonderful. Uh, people who reach out to us, us and say, the things you're doing, I find really inspiring. That's amazing. And it was for me, it started as something for me and it's turned into something else entirely different. Yeah. And it's amazing. And my friend who just had the stroke as well, now I can at least use my experience to help her through this. So if I can turn this into a positive experience for somebody else, into a help to somebody else, absolutely. That's, that's always something that's been a, a thread running through my entire life. If I can help somebody else, then it hasn't been worthless. Then there's been something valuable behind it. How, how good is it to be in that position where you can – be the confidant or the, the advisor or the emotional support to somebody who's just been through a stroke, somebody that you know so closely that if you hadn't had a stroke, you would be, well, for lack of a better word, almost helpless you know, to do anything for. Mm -hmm. But now you've got this thing in common and it's come from the shittest experience, mm -hmm. but absolutely, how good is it to be the person who can automatically bridge that gap for your friend who, you know, who without you would have experienced the same kind of gaps that you experienced. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that I'm able to. It's, it's one of the few things that makes me, that I can, that makes me happy. Now there's not a lot that makes me very happy. That makes me happy that I can, you know, I, I'm not unhappy. I'm not miserable. I'm not an unhappy person, but there's not a lot that makes me go, Oh, yay. This is great that I can help somebody else makes me think this is pretty good. What makes me really happy is helping somebody else. And that new thing I do every day, one new thing a day. And if that one new thing is helping my friend kind of have a better understanding of what she's going to go through, then it's got, then it's, then it's, it's good. That's a good thing. There's a we point should, to all of it. Yeah, there is a point, isn't there? We should give her a shout out. What's her name? Barbell. I don't, I actually sent her a link to the show. And uh, told her I'm going to be on this guy's podcast. It's about stroke recovery. You should listen to it. So I will tell her. I'm going to tell everybody when the episode goes up. But Barbell. We love you. Big kiss to Barbell. We love you. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, yeah. So this is the thing. Like many stroke survivors do what you've done. And I found myself in a similar situation because I had yeah. learned some things that – I thought would be helpful. I did start to share them. That was about me at the beginning because, you know, I wanted to feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. right. And, and it started as the podcast, 
It was called the Transit Lounge Podcast, and that was in 2015. I had a lot of ideas. I needed to download those somewhere, get them out into the world so that um, they're out of my head and they're captured somewhere in case I forgot them. I could go back and listen to them, mm-hmm. and then, and then it started. I started to get feedback from people again saying the same thing. Thank you. I needed to hear this episode. Uh, this was a great episode. I'm going to share that with somebody. And then it became this thing that was impossible for me not to do anymore. It was because I had often thought, oh, I don't, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm over it. I don't want to do this. And then it became, I can't not do this. There's so many people who are going to go through stroke that they're going to need as much information as possible. Yeah. Wow. I can't that's, stop. I feel obliged to do it. But in a good way. I, well, I feel a little, in a way, I feel obligated to get better. There's so many people watching me. Wow. It's one of the things that makes me continue to want to get better. I feel like I can't fail. I can't fail for myself. Obviously, at my, I'm my first priority. I can't fail for myself, yeah. but I can't fail all the other people who are watching from the sidelines. Yeah, I totally hear you. It's like putting it out there and creating an expectation, and then people are kind of waiting, going, all right, let's see. Is he going to trip yeah. up? Is he going to get to the end? What's going to happen with this guy? And I'm like that too. I don't want to let people down or disappoint them. Not that I I really care if they're disappointed, but from that, no, I want to show you that it is possible. And I want to be the example of how it's possible. I don't want to just talk the talk. I need to walk the walk. Yeah. And it's not a matter of, I think, disappointing other people. I'm not afraid I'm going to disappoint them because in the end, in the long run, they don't matter. I matter. Yeah. They matter in the sense that I know they're back there and I know they're cheering for me and I know they're rooting me on, but they aren't going to live the rest of my life for me. Yeah. I have to live the rest of my life and I have to make the best of the rest of the life that I have. Yeah. And the best of the rest of my life means not walking with a cane for the rest of my life. Yeah. Means being able to tie my shoes Yeah. There's there's a whole laundry list of things that I want to be able to do. And it's because it's for me, not for other people. Yeah. But that's going to help other people because they're going to go, well, all right, yep. well, if Emily did it, then maybe I can do it too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we need that. And I think hearing these conversations in the way that they're you and I are having it right now, we're talking about ourselves and what we need to do is, you know, these are things that people need to do for themselves as well. Mm-hmm. So that right. people, people listening need to go, well, oh, okay. So I need to do this for me, not for mum and dad or not for right. my person, whoever. And then the fact that they get better for themselves means that everyone else gets the benefit regardless. So that's like the right. bonus. Oh, speak of the devil. Look who just popped in the door. Where is he? I can't just- is Is that all we're gonna get (laughs) hey matt he can't hear you i'm still on the headphones oh okay he's just checking on me he's always checking on me (laughs) always checking on me it's you know i i have a lot of responsibility to myself i used to say a lot in the beginning i said i would say to matt i said i have to get better for me for you and for us he would say, you're not getting better for us. You're getting better for yourself. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah, it is so true. Um, and it's responsibility for yourself. Like it's taking mm-hmm. responsibility, isn't it? Right. And I thought I was saying it would be flattering to him. But that's sort of, he's got so much unnecessary responsibility on himself. Yeah. That that's just me putting more responsibility on him. Yeah. That's not very fair. No. Yeah, it comes from the right place, but I understand that it right. could be a little bit of a burden on him. Yeah. And um, and having the awareness about how not only how, how we are impacting our own well-being by having the types of thoughts that we have, we're also impacting the well-being of the people who care for us the most and the people right. who are doing the most for us and supporting us the most. And showing appreciate it's a way of showing appreciation also, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And carers do get a bum rap. They don't get the 
full extent of, well, they don't get any support really, do they? Who do they get support from? Unless there is right. a carer's support group somewhere, which most stroke carers can't get to because they're too busy caring for the person right. who's unwell. That's, and that's what he says. He says, well, how, well, how am I supposed to go see my own shrink? To go see my own shrink that leaves me home alone for the hour plus the hour it takes to get there and the hour it takes to get back. Yeah. There's, so that he goes to take care of himself. I'm the one who gets, and if we didn't have um, a home, home health aid, which is what they're called here in New York, home health aid, HHA, if we didn't have an HHA, he would never be able to leave the house. And yeah. we only have our Monday through Friday during the daytime hours. And luckily he's been working from home all through Corona. Yeah. So he's been home the whole time since March working, doing all of it on top of working. And I don't want this to turn into the mad appreciation hour, <laughs> but, but he does need to get recognized for all the work he puts in. Yeah. It was Matt who sent me a postcard. And yep. You got our postcard. I did, man. And I thought, Oh my God. Like that's one of the last things I expected to happen to me. <laughs> that's somebody from the other side of the planet would think, you know what we need to do? We need to send a postcard mm -hmm. to this guy in Australia, in Melbourne. And it was so lovely to receive it because it meant that what I'm doing the, had purpose. It, it meant that what I'm doing made a difference. It meant that what I'm doing helped people and it created support for people. And all the things that I imagined that it would do in that car that came in the mail was um, just like it, it cemented in my mind exactly what I thought I was doing this for. Um, he's such a cool dude, like to come up with that idea. He is a cool guy. He's incredibly thoughtful. Makes he's incredibly. And he sent it around the world to a number of people, right? I wasn't the only one yeah. who received the card. We sent to Lena in Denmark, and we sent to you in Australia. We sent to Clelia in Peru. Yeah. Uh, what else did we send to? Matt? Oh, he can't hear me now. That's all right. Uh, but yeah, we sent a couple to different places. We sent to you, Lena, Clelia, um, forget who else. There were a couple others. But it was his idea. It was like we should we should say hello to these people. He was when he was a kid, he had a pen pal from like a music magazine. He had a pen pal. And they wrote back and forth about music and all sorts of nerdy things, Dungeons and Dragons. And um, I guess he carried that over into his adult life. It's it's a lot of fun to get mail from somebody, to get real mail. It is these days, it's far better than an email. Absolutely. It was such a treat to receive it. So tell me what's on the horizon for you? What are you thinking about doing and what are your next few short-term goals and long-term goals? I know one of them is to walk without the cane. What else is on the list? Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to go for a jog. I want to be, I never wanted to be run again in my entire life more than I do right now. Um, I want to be able to go out for a jog. I want to get a new dog. I want to be able to go out for a walk with my dog. I used to have an 80 pound pit bull. <laughs> it's a good thing we didn't have him anymore when the stroke happened. Because we never, what would we have done with an 80 pound dog? So I want to get another dog, take him out for a walk. So go for a jog, get a dog, go for a walk. It's all, I want to be able to go to the gym on my own and do a workout on my own. I want to be able to travel again. Yeah get back to work, basically just get back to my life. Yeah. All amazing things. Um, can I challenge you to do that, to take the jog and then expand it a little bit and do a marathon? <laughs> um, I appreciate the suggestion, but after two spinal surgeon, spinal fusion surgeries, I'm not going to, I'm not doing any marathon. Okay. My so gotta... distance running got me into the first spinal fusion surgery. So I'm not doing any long distance running. All right. Okay. I'll, I won't hold you to that then. And I didn't realize there was another underlying reason. That's okay. 
I mentioned it because um, in one of the episodes really early on in the podcast, I interviewed um, a friend of mine, Donna Campesi. It was episode 28. Yes. Yes. I remember that episode. Yeah. And after, man, I think it was after she had a stroke when she was eight. So she's in her forties now. And so it would have been after 30 years, Donna ran a marathon because she went to a physical trainer, somebody like you probably, and said, I just want to run. Um, I just want to run a little bit or something. I don't know what. And that guy goes, yeah, well, we're not doing this, you know, five kilometer run. He goes, uh, we're doing a marathon. And she was like, what are you talking about? Oh, that's about? a very good trainer. I take that back. <laughs> I'm never running a marathon. And sure enough, they um, put in all the work. And Donna's a pretty amazing lady. And they went through all of the training and all the effort for her to finally run this marathon. And she wears a a big um, leg brace as well. And she adjusted you know, her her technique, the way that she was landing and walking and doing all sorts of things to finally get across the the line after a, a marathon. And That's I amazing. just thought she was amazing because I've never going to, I'm never going to run a marathon whether I was able bodied or not. It's just not anything that ever crossed my mind to do. But the fact that she it's did it after healthy the stroke, for you. It's not. No, as a trainer running is not good for your body. Is it too, too much uh, impact? Yeah, it's too much effort. It's not good on the joints. It's I always I explain it to people as imagine you're a Jenga tower and you're just slamming the Jenga tower over and over again on the table. Right. The Jenga tower crumbles, it falls apart. Yeah, right. So yeah. it's best avoided. So I, I think I did the right thing to motivate myself in the opposite direction and not to actually yeah. ever run a marathon. Yeah, it's not good, especially if you're running. I used to, in high school, I used to run 12 miles a day for the fun of it. No reason, just because, because I wanted to. I even wrote my college entrance essay about running. Right. And I used to love it, but I was diagnosed with this. This is going off the track, off track a little bit. At 15 years old, I was diagnosed with a spinal defect called spondylolisthesis, which try, ties into actually my carotid dissection. Right. The carotid dissection, I was told that I have a soft tissue disorder. And it explains, so spondylolisthesis is a moving, your spinal column moves. So my spinal column, column shifted. It was all stacked up and then it moved forward. So my soft tissue just doesn't work properly. I've always been very mobile in my joints. So okay. the, the carotid dissection makes perfect sense. It stays right in line with all the other soft tissue not working properly. Yeah. So now you're all about trying to heal yourself and get better mm -hmm. and recover and not put your body into yep. undue stress. And, exactly. Um, make matters worse. Get strong. Get strong is the goal. Get strong and capable. Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of stroke survivors go the other way. I met, and Donna isn't one of those people who has completely gone the other way and that she's always going to run marathons. It's just a challenge that somebody um, suggested and she took up the challenge and then she achieved it. And she does amazing things in other parts of her life. Um, but I know there's a lot of stroke survivors who go from being very low, um, low effort and low, uh, low risk taking and all that to then they go next level and they start pumping weights in the gym even more. They push themselves even harder. And to me, that doesn't feel right personally because I, I feel like I don't want to wear myself thin or, or, or wear myself out sooner rather than later, you know, I, um, I just want to get strong as well. But then there's this other extreme level of effort that people put in because of the way that they've comprehended what life's about, what happened to them. Who knows? Everybody does it in their own way. You have to, you get better in the only way you know to get better. Your, your, your physiatrist can set a goal, but you're the only one who knows how to get yourself to that goal. Yeah. They're the ex, like I said, the experts have a plan and they set the landmarks and the goals for you to reach at particular times. Um, but as, as a trainer and a Pilates teacher, I'm in a unique position 
to really understand body mechanics and understand what what muscles need to go into which movement patterns. Yeah. So I know my foot turns in like this. I know what muscles I need to work on to straighten it out. And so if and if I want to go out for a jog, my foot needs to be straight. So to go out for that jog, I need to get those other muscles strong so my foot doesn't turn in. It's simple things like that. And if you want to be able, if you have a goal you want to get to, if you don't know how to do it yourself, you talk to the experts, talk to the physical therapist, talk to the resources, the people you have available to you. Yeah. Everybody who has a stroke has a physical therapist, has an occupational therapist somewhere in their recovery. Ask those people. I want to be able to, I really want to be able to play piano again, but my fingers just don't have not joined the party yet. They're still hanging off on the, they're, they're still wallflowers. They're not ready to do anything yet, but they will be. And the kid, the key word again is yet. Yeah. It's a very powerful word yet. Um, We spoke about it in the last episode as well. There's an amazing um, episode or interview on YouTube. I think it's a presentation actually on YouTube by Carol Dweck and Carol Dweck is the person who um, put a book together called um, I think it's called something about the growth mindset and that book Carol Dweck you said yeah Carol uh, C-A-R-O-L Dweck D-W-E-C-K I think and she talks about the power of yet and she's up on stage I think it's a TED talk and um, she delivers that uh, presentation and it's better so fascinating and it's so great to hear that they te- they're starting to teach the p- that power of the word yet to children at nice. s- at school so that they understand that if they haven't achieved something it's not a fail or a pass it's just they they haven't got to that point yet and it's a really just- powerful message for stroke survivors as well really is it's one of the first things i said to barbell said something you can't do today it's just a matter of yet you'll 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 figure out how to do it you just haven't done it yet yeah one of the first things i said to her emily that is an amazing way to end the podcast thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate it my pleasure i really appreciate the uh role that you play in the community online um in instagram I'm world can, yep i'm glad and, i can be part of that community i'd yeah. rather not be part of that community but if i'm going to be part of that community at least be a positive presence in it i know i know it's a community that none of us yeah jo- wanted to join have done without being part of yeah we definitely didn't want to join it but um now that we're here um i'm glad that you're you're involved to the extent that you are and um and i'm really glad to have got to know matt and i really appreciate receiving the card because everything that you guys do has made a difference to me and my recovery as well excellent thank you i'm glad it's it's it i'm really honored i told you this and is that i'm really honored that you would ask me to be on the show it's i'm just some i'm just some weirdo in brooklyn who had a stroke I'm a similar weirdo on the other side of the planet. Don't worry. <laughs> Good. Weirdos unite. We have and Emily, that's how Emily Strikes Back came to, that's how Emily Strikes Back started. Because yeah. a friend of mine was like, said, you're a badass. And I, like, I could have thought of a million better ways to show that I'm a badass. Yeah. The Emily she said, you're back. a badass. Emily, ha- the stroke had its chance. Now Emily Strikes Back. Discover how to heal your brain after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com. Medical disclaimer, courses, podcasts, and website. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience and we do not necessarily share the same opinion nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast or video material 
is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the experiences of Bill Gassiamas. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. This information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injury circumstances or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professionals. If you are experiencing a health emergency or you think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.